Amen. As you all are seated this morning, let me just ask you to grab a Bible. Um, if you didn't bring one, there may be one in the seat back in front of you or underneath there. Grab that and uh, turn with me this morning to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians is where uh, we've been for the last several weeks and also where we'll be for several more weeks as we continue to journey through this incredible letter. If you happen to grab uh, one of the Bibles in the seat back in front of you, they just turn with me to page 980, and we will start there in just a moment. But I want to begin this morning by uh, just saying, first of all, thank you to those of you um, who are gathered here who maybe this weekend is especially important to you because you um, have lost uh, someone in your family in the line of service for this country as we celebrate and we remember on this Memorial Day weekend. We just want to say thank you uh, to you and let you know we are praying for you. So as you are out and about this uh, Memorial Day weekend, as you're celebrating tomorrow, don't forget to pause and thank the Lord for the faithful men and women who laid down their lives so that, in a very real way, we can worship in freedom uh, like this in our country. It's something that we should not take lightly, and we must not take lightly. And so on behalf of the staff here in our church, we just want to say thank you. Uh, we love you. Uh, we remember with you this weekend, and uh, we are just grateful for the sacrifice of your loved one for our freedom here in this country. And so uh, I wanted to just start off by saying that today, and what a beautiful time it is to just pause and remember and give thanks. So let's pray together right now. Lord, I want to start this time by just saying thank you as our great God and Savior. We know that all freedom ultimately is by you, uh, from you, for you, and to you. And so, Lord, I, I just want to thank you for the freedom that we have here in this country for sure there is a lot that is not right, but Lord, one of the things that we celebrate is our freedom to gather and to worship and to praise the name of Jesus as we just sang about a while ago. And so God, thank you for that freedom. Thank you today in particular for those um, who through the years, through the decades, have laid down their lives uh, for freedom just like this. And so, Lord, for the families this weekend who continue to grieve, continue to miss, continue to uh, remember the loss of a loved one, we pray for them today especially. And we ask that you would be the God of peace in their life. And, Lord, that you and you alone would minister to them in ways that none of us could. So today, our great God, we say again, thank you. Thank you for the freedom we have in Jesus and the freedom we have in this country to worship you fully, in Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen. Hey, uh, also let me take one care of one little bit of business uh, before I jump into the message today, and that is we have some exciting news to share and a reminder for especially all of our covenant members. Next Sunday, or, or really next weekend, um, our executive pastor, we're going to get a chance to meet and to affirm and to just uh, celebrate with them. Uh, the candidate is coming on Friday. His family is going to be here um, on Friday night. If you're a covenant member, you should have gotten an email that tells you on Friday night when it is that he'll be up here and you can come meet and greet his family. If you so choose on Saturday morning, a lot of our leadership will be meeting with him as well. And then on Sunday, um, I'll bring him up here with me. He'll share some of his story, hopes, and dreams for what God has in store for us here at the Mount. And then after second service, for those of you who work with kids, before you go and celebrate over there as a volunteer, after second service, real quick, we'll enter into a business meeting and we will affirm him as our executive pastor. So we want all of you to come and be part of that. It's going to be an incredible time of celebration. And so this has been weeks, months uh, in the making. And so we just want to thank God 
for what he's done. Can we just celebrate this morning, man? Next week, we'll, uh, we'll get to just worship and, and celebrate and affirm him together. And then also on the heels of that, as we praise God for a new executive pastor, I've got a prayer request for you as well. We sent out um, the uh, first listing for a children's minister this week. Already we have over 20 applicants in for that. And so our personnel team is beginning to filter through those. And we are excited about the possibility and potential there. So as you are thanking God for a new executive pastor, I want you also to pray with us for our upcoming children's minister as well. Amen? Enough of business. Let's jump into the Bible here, all right? In Philippians chapter number one, I want to begin where we ended last week. Last week, we started in Philippians 127, and we got no further. So today, I hope we'll make some more ground. But in Philippians 1 and verse number 27, remember, this is the Apostle Paul writing back to a church in Philippi, a church that God used him to start, a church that now a decade or so later is flourishing, is thriving, but he writes from a prison cell back to his brothers and sisters in Philippi, and here's what he says. He says only, or this one thing, or hey, don't neglect this. Here's what he says. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. I will not preach that again this morning, and I want to encourage you to go back and listen if you happen to miss last week, because last week we unpacked what does it look like as a believer to now live in a way in a manner that is worthy of the gospel that has saved our life. And so he says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are, say it with me, church, you are what? Standing firm. You're standing firm in one spirit with what, church? With One mind, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and that you're not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that's from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also what church? Suffer. For his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort in love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy completes my joy, he says, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full of cord and of one mind. Now do nothing out of rival, rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others, what church? Say it with me. More what? Significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours In Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the very form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he, what church, humbled himself, becoming what church? obedient to the point of death, even what? Death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, what church? Say it with me. Every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And what church? Say it with me. Every tongue confess that, say it again, Jesus Christ 
is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As we read these uh, scriptures here, as we walk through this passage this morning, I want you to see Paul's plea. I I want you to see what Paul is longing for. I want you to see what Paul is asking for. I want you to see and grasp what it is that the Apostle Paul, in the midst of a prison cell, what he is telling the church in Philippi, he longs to see. Number one, write it down. Paul says, I want to hear. I want your reputation to be I want the news about the church in Philippi to be this. I want to hear that you are united in spreading the gospel. Just write that down if you're taking notes this morning. Paul wanted to hear the news that he longed to to, to enter into his cranium was this news. You know that church in Philippi? Man, they are, they're united you know what they're united around? They're united in spreading the gospel. They're united in telling the good news. Look with me in verse 27. Here's how he says it. He says, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, what's the gospel? The gospel is the good news. If you ever see the word gospel, just translate it in your head, good news. It's the good news of who? It's the good news of Christ. The good news that Jesus Christ, the sinless one, lived a sinless life, died a sinner's death, put in a borrowed tomb, resurrected the third day, ascended to the Father, now offering life to all who would trust in him. Guys, this is good news. You don't know why it's good news? Because you don't deserve it. I'll say that again because obviously you don't believe me. It's good news because you don't deserve it. Amen? Amen. I don't deserve it. It's good news because it is undeserved love. It is undeserved life. It is an undeserved offering from the Father to sinful man through the sinless death of his son. And he says, if you come to me, you will have life. Check this out. He says, so let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, that I may what? I may, uh, I may what? Hear of you that you are, here we go, that you are what church? Standing firm, how? In one spirit with what? One mind striving how? Side by side for the faith of the gospel. Paul wanted to hear that the church in Philippi, that they were united. Look at the united words. Check it out. One spirit, one mind, side by side. This is what he wanted to know. He wanted to hear that they were united. You want to know what makes a pastor happy? I'll tell you. Here's what makes a pastor happy. When the church is united. I mean, I'm just going to be gut level honest with you. It wouldn't matter to me what news came across the wires today. It wouldn't matter to us what happened in the world around us. If we knew that our church was united on mission, united in spreading the gospel, it wouldn't matter what happened. Your pastors in this place, we would be a happy people. But let me tell you what will make a pastor and let me tell you what will make a staff just what will just mess us up when the church isn't united. When there's bickering and backbiting and complaining and arguing and fussing and fighting about stuff that really doesn't matter. It's like nobody wants to serve there. Nobody wants to work there. Nobody wants to worship there. Nobody wants to be part of that. And Paul says, here's what I want to hear. Here's what I long to hear. Here's what will bring me joy in the midst of jail. You're like, what would bring you joy in the midst of jail? Hearing that you are standing firm in one spirit, that you are united with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. How were they united in spreading the gospel? They're united in spreading the gospel by what? By standing firm. This is what he first says. I wanna hear that you're standing firm. 
Get the picture of standing and no one being able to move you. It's like you or I going outside and pushing on the walls of this building. You can push all you want. You can strain all you want. You can pour all the power into it you want, but it ain't moving. It's immovable. It's standing firm. And this is the picture that Paul paints for the church. He says, here's what I want to hear. I want to hear that you are standing, say it with me, church, firm How? In one spirit. I want to hear you have a holy confidence in who you are, that you are immovable, unshakable, that you are full of the confidence in Christ. And this is what we want for the church. We want to be a people and this to be a place where our people, man, they just know who they are in Jesus. And no matter what happens outside of the walls, man, we know where our faith is. It's like Paul, I know whom I have believed in. And I am persuaded that he is able to guard it until that day. Guys, this is the cry of Paul. They're united in spreading the gospel. How do you spread the gospel? By standing firm, by standing your ground. Sounds a lot like Ephesians chapter six. You ought to write that down and read up on Ephesians six this week and all of the armor of God. And what is the purpose of the armor of God? It's so that you may stand. And he says, and after you've done all that you've done, you stand, you stand your ground. You stand on your convictions. You stand on who God is. You stand on the faith of Jesus Christ. No matter what news comes, no, no, no matter what psychology enters the world, no, 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 no matter what spirit is rolling about, we stand firm in our faith. They're united in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. How? How? By standing firm. You ever found yourself not standing firm. Maybe you're in a conversation over coffee. Maybe you're in a classroom in school and somebody says something, challenges you in a way and you're like, ooh, I don't know. And you're just all of a sudden shaken. Here's what Paul says. I want to hear. I want to hear that you're spreading the gospel by standing firm in your faith. Secondly, how, how, do, they, how, how, do, they, how do they unite in spreading the gospel? By staying fully focused. How many people drive in here? How many people drive? Hold your hand up high. You drive a car, hold your hand up high. This is not high, by the way. This is high, all right? Yeah, you, you, yeah, you drive. Okay, good. How many of you, keep your hands up. How many of you, let's, we're honest time, all right? How many of you, keep your hands up if you drive. I'm looking, all right? You drive, keep them up. How many of you have ever, ever, ever checked your phone while you're driving? Go and put your hand down. Those of you with your hands up, never, not once, there's one of you that aren't, two of you that aren't telling the truth in here, but the rest of us are able to just deal with our inadequacies, right? What is the problem with checking your phone out while you're driving? You aren't fully what? Focused. It's what? It's dangerous. It's deadly. It is, has dire consequences. You're like, well, I survived. But, and we get this idea that I really don't have to stay fully focused. I don't really have to stay engaged or I got this so good. I got this mastered. I can do both of these. Any of you ever judge anybody else for looking at their phone while they're driving? Yeah, you know, you weren't that one minute and somebody passes you like this. You're like, I can't believe looking at their phone while they're driving. What is wrong with these people? And then you get it, you're like, oh. You know, yeah, so the fact is this, is that we've got to stay fully focused in this thing called life. And Paul says, I want you to stay fully focused in spreading the gospel. You see, so many times we can get off, off track and we, 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 can, we, can, we can waver one way or another. And here's what Paul says. He says, I want to hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with what church? One mind. I want to hear that you're unified, that you're, that, that as a church body, you're unified in mission and vision, that you all know where you're going and you're all going in the same direction, that you're all in the same boat and you're all rowing for the same destination. And what is our destination around here? Look at the wall. We exist, just in case you wonder, to what? Glorify who? 
God. Help me out here. As who? As disciples. And what are we to be doing as disciples? Say it. Making disciples. And how is all of this done? Through the what? Gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of you are going, I've never seen that. Welcome to the party, all right? But this is why we exist. It's it's what we're about. You should never have to wonder. I wonder what the mount's about. Here's what the mount's about. Making much of God. As disciples who are making other disciples, this is why we exist. And we want to stay fully locked in and focused on our mission. It's a mission that was given to us by our Father when he said, Go therefore and what church? Make what? Y'all act so excited about that too. Thank you very much. One person's excited. Make disciples, like raise people up, like call people from death to life and then train them up and raise them up and send them out. And I love the first, I love that he put go before he said make disciples, although, although the imperative is make disciples. But what did he say before make disciples? He said go or as you go. The point is this, if we're not careful, we can turn inward real quick. And the call and the mission is vision is for us as we grow inward to go outward. Go and make disciples of all nations. And he's saying, here's what I want to hear. Here's what I want to hear about. Here's the report, the news. Here's the tweets I want to hear about the church in Philippi. Here's the pictures I want posted on Instagram. Here's the videos I want to be watching on YouTube about the church in Philippi. Man, you are fully focused. You are locked in. You are on mission. And then he says this, you are unified in spreading the gospel by working hard. This is where most of us tap out. We think church is supposed to be easy, like this whole Christian life is supposed to be easy. How many, if you've walked with Jesus for a while and you figured out that walking with Jesus ain't easy, just hold your hand up high. Like, like it ain't, you don't have to walk very long to figure that out either, do you? You're like, yeah, I figured, no. Walking with Jesus, man, it's work. And it takes work. Look, look at what he says. He says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit, that you are of one mind. And what's the next thing he says that you're what? You're striving. Does that sound like eat? Notice he doesn't say that you're coasting side by side. Kumbaya through this world. It's not what he says. He says, I want to hear that you're striving, like vein popping out of your neck, striving, sweating. Man, I want you to understand that it is work to spread the gospel. Nobody spreads the gospel accidentally. It's work. And this is why most of us don't have anything to do with it, because we're too busy. We're too afraid. We're too scared. We got too much going on. We don't have time. But so he says, he says, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Get the picture of someone running beside you, agging you on. My wife, my, my wife, um, for a season, helped train marathon runners. Just so you know, when she says, hey, would you like to go run? I'm thinking around the block. She's thinking around the city, all right? It's, it's two totally different aspects there. She's like, I'm like, hey, how much you run it? Oh, I just went out, I just, you know, it was easy, like six miles. I'm like, six miles, that's a race. I need a medal. <laughs> like, I, w- I want a medal when I'm done with that one, right? Anybody? Come on, somebody, right? I'm like, I better get a reward when this is over, all right? Not, oh, yeah, I just went out for a little jug, whatever, right? <laughs> But I, I don't run with her. But when I did run with her, I can remember jogging. You know, first mile, I got this, right? After that first mile, I'm like, we done, baby, you know? And then side by side, because she's good like that, she's like, come on, right? She's agging me on and, and stirring me on. And it should fire me up, right? Sometimes it did. Sometimes it made me mad. I'll just be honest, right? I'm like, slow down. She's like, come on. I'm like, you're setting the pace, all right? So... Here's the thing, though. Here's the picture. In Christ, we are to be working side by side. Notice that the gospel work, that the gospel spreading is not an individual activity. It is a church community effort. 
It's us together, side by side, spurring one another on, lifting each other up, encouraging one another. Man, telling, let's go, let's go, let's go. And so this, he wanted to hear they were united. They were united in spreading the gospel. By how? By standing firm, by being united in, in, in one spirit, by working hard. And then he just blows, blows my mind. They were united in spreading the gospel by suffering well. We don't hear much about suffering in the church, but it's all over the Bible. But you know, like if I said, hey, we're gonna have a six week series on suffering. Right? That's usually not like a church building strategy, all right? But, but the truth is this, that, that suffering is all over the Bible. And what you find out is those, according to Scripture, who desire to live godly lives, they not might suffer, they not possibly will suffer. The Bible says anyone who desires to live a godly life will what? Suffer. Will suffer. Ch- check out what he says. He says, so I want you to let your life be lived in a manner worthy of the gospel. Be united, standing firm, in one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And then look at what he says in verse 28. I love it. And not frightened in anything by your, what, what? Opponent. What's an opponent? Someone who is what? With you or against you? They're against you, right? He says, I don't want you to be frightened in anything by your opponents. In other words, church, as we unite to spread the gospel, there is also another uniting to oppose the gospel. As you and I unite to tell the world about Jesus, there's another uniting to dampen down the message of Jesus. And here's what he says. I want you to be united, fully focused. I want you to be united, striving side by side, working hard. But I want you to be united in spreading the gospel by suffering well. Know what's going to come. As a matter of fact, look at what he says about suffering. He says, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. You see, I, 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 there's a lot of reasons that we don't tell other people about Jesus. There's, there's a ton of reasons why we don't talk about our faith more openly, more honestly, and more often. There's a lot of reasons, but here's what I believe is one of the biggest. Fear. Fear. We're just afraid. We're afraid. See, I'm convinced that most people don't live, show, or tell the gospel simply because they're afraid of the consequences. What will happen if they find out I love Jesus and I believe Jesus is the way, is the truth, is the life, is the hope of the world? We're just afraid of the consequences. But look at what he says. He says, there is a clear sign to your opponent's of their destruction, but of your salvation. And what is the clear sign? Don't answer, just look, look at it. What is the clear sign to the watching world who would oppose the gospel of their destruction and of our salvation? What's the clear sign to them? It's found in the very first part. The clear sign to the world that we are saved and they're in need of a savior is that we are not what frightened we're not frightened you you want to scare somebody don't let them scare you you want to you want to have just a bold witness for Christ when someone tells you to sit down and shut up Stand up and speak up. That'll mess people up. You see, when, when in the U.S. they said, you cannot pray in school any longer, and the church said, okay, the world said, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. But you see, when our 
children and our teachers, despite laws, go ahead and pray in school anyway, it tricks people out. They're like, you can't do that. You can't talk about Jesus. You can't pray and you do it anyway. They don't know what to do with that. They're like, uh, 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 uh. Why? Because it, it's standing against what they want to do. They want to frighten you. They want to silence you. They want to smush you and quiet you and dampen you and shut you up. But when the church speaks out and lives out anyway, what happens? It is a clear sign. They're like, they must be legit. Dude, something's real about this guy. Man, man, that that young lady, she must believe what she really says she believes. Now, look at what he goes. He goes on and he says this. He says, it's a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation. And he says, verse 29, you're just going to have to, you're just going to have to marinate in this week because it's probably new to some of us. Check it out. He says, for it has been granted to you. What does the word granted communicate? Gift, right? Think about it. It's been gifted. Now, this trips me out. It's been gifted to you. It's been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him. So the first gift is what? That's not a trick question. Belief, right? Belief is a gift from God. We see it over and over in scripture. I don't have time to unpack all that, all right? But if you believe in God, listen to me close. It was a gift from God that you believe, okay? And he says, it has been granted or gifted you not only to believe in him, which we love. I'm like, thank the Lord he allowed me to believe. Thank God he let me trust him. Thank God he called me out of death. And thank God he's rescued me. Thank the Lord he saved me. But then he gives another. It's not just that you've been given salvation. You've been given the gift also to what? Suffer. Suffer. To suffer for his sake. This is a whole nother, this a whole nother level right here. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I like believe, receive, enjoy, right? I don't know about this believe, receive, suffer stuff, right? I'm not sure about that. But it's, it, it's, it's almost foreign to us in this freedom that we have here in America. But it was absolutely foreign for believers in the New Testament to trust in Christ without suffering. And here he's saying it is not just, it's not, I love it, it's not your cross to bear. What is it? It's a what? It's a gift. Do you see suffering as a gift? Because I don't know that I do. Like, like I, I went, what, man, I, I don't think it's a gift when someone comes up and goes, hey, man, I heard what you said about Jesus, and I don't disagree. I think you're an idiot. Like, I don't, I don't immediately go, what? thank you, Lord, for that. That's a sweet gift. Thank you, right? I think the gift's like, bro, you knocked it out the park today. Home run, sayonara. That was awesome. That's a gift, right? That, in my eyes. But a gift from the Lord might be, might be persecution. A gift from the Lord might be rejection. A gift from the Lord might be ridicule. A gift from the Lord might be loss. He says, this is, you've been granted a gift not only to believe in him, but to suffer for his name. And most of us won't experience the suffering because we're afraid of the suffering. We don't see it rightly. When we begin to see suffering as a gift, what, what do we have to fear? It's kind of like when you know what's going to happen when you die, you're not afraid to live. But until you're secure in your death, you're not ready for life. But when Christ rescues your heart and he sets you free, who cares? What is the world going to do? Oh, I might suffer, so let's just talk about some things. What are some potential consequences of sharing the gospel? I just thought we'd just talk about it. Let's be honest. What are some potential consequences of the gospel? I should have put, what are some potential gifts of sharing the gospel? But I put consequences, all right? But what are they? Okay, here's a potential consequence. Rejection. Students, pay close attention. Adults, pay close attention. One of the potential consequences of you trusting in Christ and living and talking and, and, and showing that to the world is rejection. 
You can be rejected by your family. If your family's not believers and all of a sudden you are, you could experience rejection. Your friends, your friends that once didn't, know, that don't know Christ and now you know Christ and like, bro, you're different. What's wrong with you? Get out of here. So there could be friends there. You, you could be rejected by coworkers. I mean, imagine you start talking about Jesus around the water cooler and you start living for him in your job. Your coworkers could reject you. Hey, your neighbors, imagine, imagine if you, if we actually engaged our neighbors with the gospel and you find out they're not believers. I mean, you, you could be like, man, I, this could be bad. This could go bad. And we have this fear. Right? We have this fear. It, y'all are so afraid right now, you won't even speak. You're like, nothing, man. But yeah, rejection, that's a real consequence. So let's just put it out there. Hey, ridicule. Let's just go ahead and throw it out there. You could be ridiculed for being a Christian. It can happen. It does happen. Let's just throw it out there. You stand up for biblical values, you're going to get ridiculed. You stand up for biblical marriage, you will get ridiculed. You stand up with Jesus as the only way. You're an isolate. Yes, you will be ridiculed. You can be ridiculed by family, by friends. You can be ridiculed on social media. So let's just throw it out there. It's okay. Let's put it out there. Let's talk about it. Let's swim in that pond for a little bit, all right? Let's just start. Oh, I'm, what could ha- Here's what could happen. You could face persecution. You could be verbally persecuted in this world. You could be physically attacked. You could have psychological attacks, emotional attacks, spiritual attacks. We could name the gamut, right? But this is legit. You could be persecuted in this world for not only knowing Jesus, but showing Jesus. So let's put it out there. Let's talk about this. Let's stop, let's stop being scared of what we might be scared about. Let's just throw it out there. Hey, you could suffer loss. I know people who have lost friends because they came to Christ. I know people who have lost popularity. This is what, parents, this is so important. And students, just listen to me. Listen, you're, you're probably not going to be the most popular kid in school if you're fully following and in love with Jesus. Not, I'm not saying you're not going to be a good student. I'm not going to say you're not going to have friends. I'm not going to say any of that. But I will say this. It's probably going to be very difficult. And I'm going to read a verse here in a minute that will show that to you. Hey, hey it's, you're probably not going to be the most popular coworker, Right? Because you're just going to be different. You're not going to be like everyone else. I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not saying like carry signs and, you know, go to work pointing fingers and live in a job. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, man, just showing, loving, and telling the love of Christ, man, the message of the gospel, you could suffer loss of friends and popularity, your job. I know people have been told, hey, you cannot talk about Jesus at work. And so now they have a dilemma. Well, what do I do? How do, how do, I, how do I wrestle with this, man? What am I? So you could lose your, you could lose your status, all of these things. So these are potentials, and you could probably list a thousand more. We could probably list a thousand more. And I believe that once we just put them out there and go, hey, you know what? It's not the end of the world. Hey, guess what? There are more friends. There are more jobs. There, you know, Paul's in prison writing this to people. Like there's a better life than even right now. So let's just throw it out there. I'm not trying to be a downer today. Everybody looks sad all of a sudden. I'm not trying to be a downer, all right? I'm just trying to be honest. And let's just throw it out there and let's at least talk about this. That, man, Ryan, in your group, I'm afraid to talk about Jesus because, and here's the consequence, and just put it out there. Just talk about it and pray through it. Let me, let me give you a couple of scriptures that I, I hope will, will help you suffer well. John 15 says it like this. Jesus speaking, if you are of the world... The world would love you as its own. But, but because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore, what church? Say it with me. Say it, say it with me. Everybody, the world hates you. So just go ahead, highlight that one, put it as a, like, hide it in your heart, memorize that one. So when ridicule comes, persecution comes, loss comes, rejection comes, you can go, oh, Jesus told me about that. Isn't it amazing that the Lord points to 
And he reminds us of that living united for the spread of the gospel will bring about suffering. And no wonder he says in Matthew 5 these words, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. <clears throat> when you think about the blessed life, do you think about this blessing? I have a feeling that most people who are preaching it aren't talking about this. But we're blessed when you're persecuted for righteousness sake, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you, persecute you, utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Here's our word for the whole series. Verse 12, say it with me, church. Rejoice and be glad. Hey, you're being persecuted. Praise God. But nobody, that's, we're like, ah, what? Like rejoice, be glad for your reward is great. Where? In, say it, heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So he wants them to be united. United in spreading the gospel. Fully focused. Working hard. Standing firm. And suffering well. That's point one. Let's look at point two. He wants us to be united in spreading the gospel. He wants us to be united in serving one another. In churches, we tend to go one way or the other. Hey, we're a church that just serves and love, man. It's like family. And like you can't get in the family, right? Because they're so family. You're like, you're like man, y'all guys are so tight. Like I'm trying to come, but you guys won't even let me in. So, so we're so, and then the others are, man, it's just all about what's out there. It's not an either or, it's a both end. And, and Paul says, you want to know what's going to, what I want to hear in, the, in, in prison, what's going to bring joy in the jail cell is that you're united in, in, in the gospel, in spreading the gospel, but you're united in serving one another. We're in chapter two. By the way, this is a win for me. I was hoping to get to chapter two today, all right? So we've won already. Look close. He says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, remember, he just told them they've been given the gift of suffering. And now he goes, but if there's any encouragement, and I want you to know he's not questioning, is there any encouragement in Christ? It, the, the form of speech, it's kind of like sense. There's encouragement in Christ. Since there's comfort from love, since there's participation in the spirit, since there's affection and sympathy, here's what I want you to do. Complete my joy by, here's the unity again, check it out. Complete my joy by being of the what? Same mind, having the what? Same love, being in what? Full accord and of what? One mind. What would complete Paul's joy? What would, would just, what would just, he'd be like, mm, I can rest well now. What would it be? It would be unity. Unity in the church. Unified in spreading the gospel and making disciples. Unified in loving one another. Unified in serving one another. Look, look at how he explains it in verse three. What's the first two words? Do what? Nothing. Period? No. There's no period, right? I know some of you think that's what you're called to do in church. Nothing. No, it's not it. Here it is. Right. Dad, we'll keep going. I'm glad y'all are still awake and laughing. So do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in what church? In humility. Humility counts others, what church? More significant than who? Yourself. Anybody find that difficult to do? Anybody find considering others more significant than yourself difficult to do? We all do, right? I'll give you an example. Again, how many of you drive? You're welcome. Go ahead, hold your hands up. You drive, right? All right, now imagine you're driving down the road. I'm just going to show you how fleshly we all can be. And it's two-lane road, and all of a sudden it goes from two lanes down to one lane. Do you consider others better than yourself? In that moment, let's be gut level honest. You're coming down and you're in the right lane and you know everybody's going to merge into your lane. And now you look in your side view mirror and there's a car speeding up beside you. And what do you think? I'm going to be like Jesus and just let them ride on in. Do you stick your hand out the car? Come on up. You give them one of these? Or do you give them some other signal when you stick your hand? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. 
No, what does our flesh do? What does our flesh do? I don't think so, right? Oh no, you didn't, right? And what do you do? You get as close as you can to the person in front of you. I know, because I see y'all driving, right? No, because I know me, all right? I know. Isn't that funny how our flesh comes out in those moments where we're like, ah, oh, this is my lane. It's, it's one spot, people, right? But do we think immediately, let me, you know what? It'll be best and safest if I leave proper distance and just let them merge right in. Oh, no. Although that would be right and godly. And if you have a mount sticker on your car, the right thing to do, all right? But what do we do? We speed up. We crunch it in. We're like, I don't think so. Have you seen the size of my car? I will take you out, right? And and all this stuff goes to, no, that's just a micro, it's just a little picture of the selfishness that resides in each of our hearts. It's just a small picture, truly, of how, and we laugh about it, and it is funny until there's a wreck, then it's not funny, but we're like, oh, man, and, and as my wife would say, driving is not a game, all right, so, so we all got that, but it's a true sign of, of our hearts, and here's what he says, I want you to consider others as more significant than yourselves. Look, let each other look not only after his own interests, but also after the interests of others. Listen, you're put in this body, in this place, in this church, in this gathering, among these people, because we need each other. We need you and you need us. It's mutual, and we ought to consider others better than ourselves, and we ought to leverage what we have for the good of the common goal of spreading the gospel and serving one another. And you know what happens when we serve each other rightly? The gospel spreads rightly. Because isn't this exactly what John recorded in John 13, 35? By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, said Jesus, if you have what? What? Love, period? No. Love for one another. When the church unites, serves one another, loves one another, encourages one another, spurs one another on, works together for the gospel, what you see is a love that transforms the world. So we're united in spreading the gospel. We're united in serving one another. And as Jason comes, I want to share how we are united in seeing lives changed. I'm just going to read this last part. And I want you to see what it tells us about Jesus. There's no way for me to unpack all that it says about Jesus here. Like it's an entire sermon series in and of itself. But, But I want you to see what the Bible says about Christ. He says to the church, have this mind among yourselves, which is in, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now he talks about Jesus. He, it's almost a hymn that he writes here. He says, he says, who though he was in the form of God, he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but, but he made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men. Listen, this is the King of kings, the Lord of lords who humbled himself. He stepped out of heaven, off his throne, into humanity. He was found in human form. And what did Christ do, church? He, what? Say it with me. Humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And what, church? Every what? Tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, we are united in spreading the gospel. And we are to be united in serving one another. Why? So that we can be united in seeing lives changed. I'm going to let you in on a little secret of my life. I, if 10 people showed up today and lives were changed, I'd be full. I'd be full. But if a thousand people show up today and nobody's changed, 
I'm going to leave empty. Why? And I, I want you to understand this. I, I don't care if the budget's met, the lights are on, and the carpet is clean, and the groups are full. If life change isn't happening, my question is, what are we doing? What are we doing? Because I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not down for just country club Christianity in it, all right? Like, like I want to see people change. I, I want God to invade people's lives. I want, I want the message of Christ to step into the mess of our life. And I want you to know today that this is what we're about. This is what we will unite around. We will unite around the continual spread of the gospel so that lost people can be saved, dead people can come to life, that, that, that people that are lost without Christ can be found. We're, we're going to unite in serving one another. I think one of the things we do really well is loving one another. You're like, well, I don't really love each other. Well, we'll work on that, all right? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll confess that and repent of that and, and get working on that. But here's what I want us to pray for today. I want us to pray that we would be a place and a people where we're seeing lives changed. Lives changed. Marriages healed. Bonds broken. Sin repented of. Salvation happening. The poor cared for. Injustice solved. Acts of mercy and kindness and love. I want to be a part of a place like that, don't you? And here's what I know. I told Jason and the staff and the elders this morning, hey, you know what? That's an act of God, though. Like, I can't change anybody, and this is why we pray. And so if you're able to here in a moment, I'm going to ask you to just turn around in your seat and get on your knees right, right there in your chair. I'm just going to ask, if you're able to, if you're not, no worries. But if you're able to, I'm going to ask you to get on your knees and together, here's what I want us to unite and pray for. Three things. Unite today. Let's pray that God would use us to spread the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ, both here and around the globe. So number one, pray. God, unite us in spreading the gospel. Number two, that God would use us, unite us in serving one another. That the love we have for one another would be a witness to this watching world. And then number three, that God would unite us in the mount, in this place, and these people would be known for a place where lives are changed. Can we agree on that today? Can we pray together for that? So if you're able to, would you just bow on your knees right there at your chair? If you're able, would you turn and just get on your knees? Jason's going to begin to sing over us, and we're going to ask God to do this on us, in us, and through us. May the gospel spread. May we serve one another. May we see lives change.